Right, our last final group is in the wings. Let's see, we've got Asby, we've got John, we've got Brett, and we have Alex. Fantastic, great to see you again. Oh, wow, this is the last segment. Everything's going so smoothly. Thank you guys so much for joining. It's so wonderful to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here. And, and congratulations, 500. Yay! That's a huge number. <laughs> Tonight's a marathon for you. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> oh, it's been so nice, like all the different segments. And everybody, like I'm sure you guys know, everything is connected. Yeah. So even though we've had four different topics, there's so many underlying connections already. And I'm sure also connected to the kind of passion you all have. Um, so for people watching, I'm sure you know all of these wonderful people. We have people who are very passionate about traditional Japanese building design and houses here. And I love having you guys in the same room. This is fantastic. Really. Yeah, great to have everyone here together. Yeah. It's only because it's you who invited us all. <laughs> I love it. Um, so of course, you're all, you were all together at the first Minka Summit. That's one connection, right? And then uh, we missed you so much, Alex and John, this year at the Minka Summit. Um, mm, but as so we read, mm. yeah. Um, but the connections are still there, uh, even with you in in uh, Thailand, Alex. Mm. How's everything going? Would you like to start? You've been involved in some interesting projects there. Oh, well, I built a little house up in Chiang Mai. Yeah, that was, looks amazing. You no, know, it was a big challenge for me because I've now done, you know, dozens of houses, but they're all old ones that we've restored. And the idea was to modernize these old houses. And this is the first time that I built a house from scratch, and it was a brand new house. And not only that, it's not like it's built in Thai style or something. It's actually very modernist. And we use steel superstructure and concrete floors, you know, um, brick walls that were uh, plastered, uh, not, not um, you know, Japanese plaster, but, you know, all very modern, with one twist, uh, which is that it's thatched. <laughs> and so I was going back to my Chiori roots, and I really love it. It's very simple. It's very minimal, like Chiori. I mean, these old uh, Japanese uh, farmhouses... They, they were like this one, they were empty. They were just a, a expanse of wood floors. And you looked up and you saw the thatch and that's what it was. And so I've kind of gone back to that in this modern way, but we did it with Thai thatch, which is rather different. So it was quite an experiment. It's never been done what we did because he, it's Thailand's a lot like Japan. Thatch is for old things. And in fact, there's a huge boom internationally in Europe should say in in Denmark and Holland and France where they're doing these incredible super modern thatch buildings museums private houses even city halls you know are thatched in Japan that's just unthinkable because thatch means old right and Thailand too thatch either means old or some kind of a tourist pavilion you know so the idea that you would build a modern house and thatch it that was rather new and, and the Thatchers didn't quite know what to do. So uh, it was an experiment. Wow, well, um, Brett, I remember seeing you at the French uh, couple's thatch house and they mm -hmm. learned, and Asby, I saw you there as I was leaving, um, they had learned how to grow the straw, harvest the straw, make the thatch roof, and now they're passing the knowledge off to others. What, what was your feeling about that, Brett? Did you enjoy that? Oh yeah, definitely. I enjoyed meeting them and, and talking to them and, and uh, that's something that I sort of have waiting for me in the fairly near future. So I was definitely interested to, uh, to see and talk to them about that. Up, up until this point, everything I've done is, is with tile roofed uh, houses for the most part and, and uh, looking forward to a project in Nagano where I'll be dealing with thatch. So, oh yeah, that's wow. Exciting. That's amazing. Asby, what did you think of that, that house? Um, I loved it. And, um, you know, I, I admire people who take that kind of project on. And I, I think a few things that struck me. One, on the one hand, they're very hardcore, authentically oriented, 
but at the same time very experimental and doing new things like they made that bizarre chicken feeder and their you know the the, the house for the you know the you know the, the animals and the the, the 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 stable for the horses and and it's all not really traditional but done with a very strong traditional sensibility and a great awareness of you know the need to to link things uh, environmentally ecologically etc so i like that and I'm thinking, yeah, it would be great if, as the years go on, like five years down the road, if we saw more people doing that kind of thing uh, with that yeah. kind of love and also uh, design sensibility and, and care. That's and lots awesome. of uh, work with the community as well, right? So yeah. linking yeah. a lot of those projects with other community members who are, uh, you know, whether they're, uh, you know, taking the trees out of the forest or... Uh, what have you so i think that community connection that they have is is really important as well yeah yeah so many things r rely on growing community and again we've already looking and and alex you know you think of your, your, your what you've been doing since 30 years ago whatever and i look back over these decades and wow it's grown into this incredible community uh and it, it very, has. very very international community yeah. and lots of know-how and yeah. lots of experience to be shared and easier to approach. And this is the key. It's always about the people and finding people who, who want to do the same things, who love the same things. And that group's growing to an incredible degree. I have to say the first Kuminka Summit was a real shock to me. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that there were so many people out there and they were doing some fascinating things. I mean, it's, it's very active and lively and there's more and more and more, as I'm sure we all know, you know, we get requests and uh, from mm -hmm. all over the world nowadays. Uh, everyone wants to own a Kominka. <laughs> yeah. uh, little do they know what a black hole it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, John, let's get you in here. Uh, you've been doing workshops. So talk about getting people involved, right? You've been doing carpentry and other workshops in your area, haven't you? In... Uh, not here in Okayama, oh, okay. no. Um, we've been invited to the US. Uh, and Yamamoto's, he's in Maine right now, actually doing another workshop. And uh, we're on the road to starting a school here in Okayama where we'll do month long workshops, probably Wonderful. four times a year. So yeah, we would definitely like to open up that possibility to everybody. That's great. And John, your workshops will be aimed at uh, overseas, people from overseas, non-Japanese, or what do you what are you thinking? Um, I guess it's not really aimed, but it looks like it's going to be mostly people from overseas. Um, <laughs> we've had, you know, we have about seven, eight years of taking on apprentices, so to speak, um, here. And uh, it's been, and we have so many people that want to come do that. We just don't have the capacity to do it. Um, and so it was kind of a natural extension of that i mean we still have two apprentices one from france and one from the u.s with us right now which is great um and um you know we've got a bunch of other people kind of in the works um but there's so i mean i get somebody every single day if not multiple people that want to do that and um so and you can right now uh, that goes back to what you were talking about joy with emily and everybody is that essentially right now all we can get is what's called a cultural heritage uh or i'm sorry a culture of uh, cultural studies visa which is unpaid it has to be unpaid so you have to have the money to be there for a whole year and not get paid and we can we can house our apprentices and basically make it so that they don't have to pay anything to live but um the bottom line is they can't really do anything so just having them here as a company that actually has to make money is for a year essentially worthless uh in a you know sort of brutal way of putting it um if they could stay for three years five years if japan could open that up to make it a more you know a broader longer term thing then we could actually um <laughs> do more and we could prepare professionals which is what i want to do i want people to be able to be I want people to become professionals that know what a Kominka is or a temple is or a shrine is or a tea house is and actually uh, don't have to DIY it, but actually do it right. Because I think we have to make a very strict distinction between 
saving Kominka for posterity and just fixing a Kominka that's going to last another 30 years and then it's not going to, you know, both of them are okay. But what we're trying to do is, you know, make people who can do this in the future and buildings that can last another 100 or 200 years, not just 30 or 50. Um, so hopefully the school will be kind of like the jumping off point of that. I don't know exactly how it's going to go. That's a really important point. Alex, Asby, Brett, you want to jump in here? <laughs> well, I think, uh, I mean, just what you say, John, it, it is important to, uh, to have those people, the, the people who are especially coming to, to work with you guys, to be able to get paid for that work, um, you know, especially if you're going to invest the kind of time that it takes to, to gain the skills that are required at that level, um, mm. you know, like you say, there aren't a lot of people who can who can uh, afford to do a year or longer. Yeah. If you wanted to do an actual full, you know, full on apprenticeship, mm -hmm. um, you know, with three to five years or something like that, then to to, mm -hmm. to ask someone to do that unpaid the entire time in this Impossible. you know modern yeah. life just is sort of un unreasonable. <laughs> it, it's mm -hmm. ironic that uh, Japan welcomes uh, foreigners who want to study these crafts and arts but doesn't want them to make a living from it <laughs> or a living at all. You, mm -hmm, you, know, yeah. you cannot, not only can you not make money from, from the institution where you might be studying, but you cannot make money from anywhere. Mm -hmm. We actually yeah, yeah. had, uh, I had a, a young uh, uh, intern who was fascinated by scroll mounting and we desperately need that because they're all closing down. Mm -hmm. the scroll mounters are all in their seventies and are retiring. And he gave, he was a German, he, he adored it, he really wanted to do it, but he couldn't afford that. He mm -hmm. couldn't spend three years with no income. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it is a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking back to people like um, uh, Len Brackett, who, who passed away last year, who was really, you know, uh, one of the first non-Japanese that I was aware of who really learned traditional Japanese carpentry, went back to the States to practice that. But, you know, he found a way somehow back in the 80s to be here and, and, and to apprentice and to scratch out a living at the beginning. And I've uh, met other uh, non-Japanese at the time doing it as well. Um, so I feel like there must be ways to get around these sort of administrative and bureaucratic hurdles. Um, but I think John, yeah, you're really right. Uh, when someone starts to work for you, they're not uh, giving you much of value. Uh, you're mm -hmm. it's often, you're, you're feeding them with information and experience and, 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 and giving that all to them, but it may be a long time before they can actually, uh, mm -hmm. you know, repay that in terms of their labor and skill. Uh, mm -hmm. and often, and, and, you know, we were talking two or three years, that's really not long enough, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it, it needs to be a lot longer. Uh, but this is, this is the situation all across the board. Uh, and, and yet I'm still fascinated by the degree to which it's become possible to learn about uh, Japanese carpentry skills, uh, you know, if not kominka, but other things uh, outside of Japan uh, mm -hmm. or with other people like yourself, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, who who are actually not Japanese, you know, mm -hmm. to be thinking back to 30 years, whatever, going, wow, that's mm -hmm. an amazing shift in, in mm -hmm. awareness, understanding, skill, uh, and, and sort of this global network that's grown on this. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of optimistic about it, and I think we may see some really surprising developments overseas, um, mm -hmm. people learning and um, being able to maybe then uh, continue this tradition and evolve it in a different direction. This again, Robert had great comments, you know, in the last session. You know, it tradition is about you know evolution, and that mm -hmm. these things are going in different directions, which I'm kind of interested to see. Uh, partly mm -hmm. because of this great uh, in international uh, uh, interest and and the willingness of people outside of Japan to to pay for it to make it happen. Yeah, I think we have to be optimistic about it, right? I mean, there's no point in not being optimistic about it. And, um, you know, the re but we also have to be realistic. And the reality is we kind of need to go abroad where we're way more valued um, mm -hmm. and make a little bit of money. And, uh, you know, it's not like we have to rob anybody, but just make what a daily wage is in America. And I can make four times what I make here. Um, and that has to do with what people make in Japan. Um, and also wanting to just work with regular folks and not, uh, you know, I, I don't mind working for super wealthy, but, you know, I don't mind building mm -hmm. the ceramic artist down the street's house either. So I think part of what I've decided is kind of 
I know it sounds silly, but it's almost kind of like a Robin Hood where if I go to the States and work for a little while or do something and people have, you know, as long as the client is happy and doesn't, you know, at the end of it, it's like, they're really happy. They don't, they're happy to pay that much. Um, then it's strange because your value is totally different in the U S or Europe than it is in Japan. If you want to work with the same person, you know, in like the, you know, hierarchy of our world. And so you just have to kind of fly over there and do it there and then come back and, you know, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And we can do that, which is really cool. Um, so I guess, yeah, I agree with you. I'm very optimistic about it. I just, I'd love to create more professionals. Um, well, Alex, yeah. you often talk about the projects that you do wouldn't really be possible without government funding, for mm -hmm. one thing, right? Um, but once you get it to a, a better level, then you can run a business like a guest house or you can start bringing people in. But without that buffer or higher wages, like you're talking about, yeah. John, it, yeah. it's really a problem right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, in, in the case of these government uh, projects, uh, the, the point is that Japan is addicted to public works. They're going to spend that money anyway. So my argument is don't build the useless roads and the damaging dams and all the, and the, 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 the tetrapods and the rest of it that are not needed. Instead, let's spend it on something that will actually, A, benefit the environment, B, protect the, uh, and support the culture, but more importantly, make money. Once that road is built, from there on, it's just a cost to maintain it even though it's not even used. These houses, once they're done, you know, create a, a sustainable new business, you know. But um, one of the things that came up in your earlier discussion uh, with, with Robert Yellen and, and uh, the others on the subjects of crafts is the, the real crisis that we've got in, in it really the, the subsidiary craft work. So there's the potter who makes the pot and that's kind of obvious. But what about, as Robert was saying earlier, Robert Yellen, uh, the guy that uh, makes the box or even the cords that you tie the box with or the people that provide the, the, the lumber or the tinder for that burn in the, in the kilns, all of those are imperiled. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, I hope, and while all this is slowly happening abroad, I hope in Japan it doesn't just evaporate. So yeah. that's a real concern. But yeah, sure. I was talking to a you carpenter know. in Awajishima and they were saying, you know, right now we have Hong Ibushigawara, which is like a, you know, it's a very special type of uh, roof tile. But the reality is historically that earth is so far down in Awajishima where it's famous for that, that you have to really dig down to get it. And historically, all the earth before that was used for other things. So for ceramics, for whatever. And now because it's not, and they, they have to just dig down to get it and then it costs more. And so that's starting to disappear too. So even the potter's clay is in peril right yeah. now. Yeah. And, uh, or the, the roof tiles rather as well. So that seems like, uh, you know, I mean, there's so many different examples of that um, that I could give about the, you know, all the different people that make us our work possible, you know, not just the carpenters, the carpenters were actually, things are a lot better than everything else, to be honest. Mm. There, are, there do seem to be certain areas where there's, where there is some energy and, and revitalization, you know, it, the, the, the tool market for Japanese, uh, you know, Japanese crafted chisels and, you know, that sort of thing is, is going pretty strong. And although obviously the, the tool makers are still declining, there is a demand you know, to a certain degree for that sort of thing. Uh, you mentioned thatching uh, as well. And there, there is actually sort of an increase, at least in certain areas of, of younger thatchers kind of banding together and, and forming uh, companies to, to re-thatch some houses. So there are some sort of bright spots among the, <laughs> Brett, among I'm, the uh, other I'm, I'm areas very, that are- I'm very happy you brought this one up, Brett, because, you know, thatch is my special love and interest. And uh, yes, there has really been a kind of a renaissance in thatching, mm -hmm. unexpectedly. And, uh, Evo and you have some of these young guys, and one of them, or a couple of them, have studied in Europe and have come back with these European techniques and are doing some quite experimental stuff. Of course, in Japan, there's regulatory difficulty, but still, it, they're starting to do it. And so, yeah, thatch is an exciting area. 
Yeah. I, I hear a new book coming out, uh, Alex. Is that right? On Thatch? Perhaps? Uh, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> There's some in it. Uh, but it's not on Thatch. But you uh, know, oh, I was right. Now. But, you know, thanks, for Joy. Thank you. I should do a book on Thatch. <laughs> a couple times thought about it. Uh, because, again, this idea that Thatch, and, and Thatch is wonderful on old buildings, but that isn't the only possible use of Thatch by any means. Mm -hmm. and, and within Japan, people mostly have no clue mm -hmm. of the possibilities of what's actually a very eco uh, a very advanced material mm -hmm. and so yeah thanks yeah and actually yeah made, made of a variety of different materials as well too there's not just yes. like one kind of thatch there's exactly such right. a wide variety of things yeah. that make up this thatch yeah. and there's a we big saw, yeah, there's, the whole, layers, right? yeah. and there's a whole there's a whole connection between thatching and uh, straw bales and other kind of plastering and I know an architect passed away recently who did walls of thatch which were very very beautiful which also yes. were connected with very traditional you know clay wall making yeah, yeah. I think one thing I want to then reflect on is um, you know looking back I also feel like in general things have gotten better in terms of interest more interest more people who know how to do it more people able to do this work you can find to do this work in most parts of Japan but running against time as the you know uh, crafts people are aging as materials uh, uh, wood material forestry resources are disappearing as um, you know uh, the buildings themselves are, are, are crumbling into dust so it's a race against time but I, I look back and I think wow things are much livelier and and that makes me uh, fairly optimistic about that but it's true that it's definitely a kind of ecosystem and looking way back when I was first looking at Japanese carpentry realizing that without uh, enough carpenters who need certain kinds of tools, let's say a Miyadaiko temple carpenter, the, the tool makers are not going to have the work. And, and if the tool makers disappear, well, well, there's no replacement for that. And of course, that's everything from the steel to, to like you mentioned, uh, who's going to be uh, providing the, you know, the, the forging, you know, the forges for these things as well. Uh, it's all, all interconnected. But it, for me, the central feature on Minka or this kind of traditional architecture in general is forests and what's happening to our forests. And this is a big uh, connection I found with people in other parts of the world. For instance, we spent a lot of time with the um, Timber Framers Guild who came and attended the Mink Les Minka Summit and I spent some time with them in the US last fall. Um, this is a key focus of people uh, in the US, in Canada, in Europe is is how do we maintain the, the forest resources and how do we avoid simply ha having uh, wood as a commodity that this this uh, respect for uh, this typical Japanese respect for every tree as a living being and it's a kind of sensibility that I think people really really appreciate and understand more now but yet it's a race against time and um, so I, I hope it gets better you know for the next generation I mean that's all we can do is hand things off and try to inspire the next generation I really feel like that's the position that I am now and maybe other people of our same age group are Absolutely. you know it's strange one thing that occurs to me is that um, for example as a carpenter doing this traditional work right now one thing that really changed when I was in Kyoto apprenticing 15 years ago or whatever was we used to take all uh, we you know we buy logs and we take them to the sawmill and get them sawed and now everybody has a sawmill. I mean, we bought a sawmill for our shop eight years ago or something um, because the, the sawmills are disappearing. Yeah. And I mean, Okayama, they weren't there anyways. In Kyoto, there was only a few. But in a way, it's kind of a good thing because we all have to, these smaller carpenters, we have to, we have to understand more and saw, you know, our own and then the other kind of ironic thing is that wood is just cheap as chips. You know, you can get you can get beautiful cedar, beautiful cypress, all these things uh, from Japanese, you know, locally sourced for super cheap. So the question is, what's the pivot point? Does it go? I mean, I feel really lucky in a way because I can go get that and then that helps me be able to do these projects or whatever. But I also am very prescient of the fact that this is also a broken system that's allowing it to be possible. So I wonder which way, like how we can affect it going back towards, okay, maybe the trees are a little bit more expensive, but we have more people and part of it's just doing the work and then people uh, seeing it and appreciating it. But I wonder if you guys have any insight on that. 
oh boy, well, the mismanagement of forests in Japan. Yeah. It's a massive subject. And actually, the, the book that, before I get to Thatch, the book I've been wanting to do for years and I've started a bit of work on, but it'll take years, is on the trees of Japan, including what are they? What were the great trees? And how are those, how is that lumber used? How is it valued? And what are the other uses? Something Asby would certainly know a lot about because it isn't just as lumber that they were valued, right? Their, their branches, their fruits, their leaves, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then this, the, the modern Sugi disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of this low pricing that you're talking about is the result of the mismanaged forest. And that is just a huge subject. And so far, um, you know, in, in Japan, uh, the university professors and all those people have, uh, they're, they're bought and paid for by the system. And so mostly they just tiptoe around it. Although mm. there are some wonderful books in Japanese that describe this very clearly. Mm. So there's something to talk about it. But so far it hasn't quite been really dealt with. And so I'm dying. That That is my project for the next few years, trees. Mm. That sounds like a great book, very important. Yeah. Um, we're all paying a tax to the forests right now. Did you notice that on your national tax this year? There's a percentage that we're all giving to the forest and I, I hope that will help. Uh, oh, but Joy is yeah. just going to plant more suki. Oh yeah. no, no, and no, even, please say the no. no. That's what it is. And, <laughs> and yeah, the low pollen suki. Right. Yeah, no. so, it's, I thought it was to thin the forest. You thought it was to make like deciduous forest or mixed forest? Yes. But no, there are. Am there I are, too naive? Yeah. It's there to are more sugi. Yeah. Oh, no. but there are good initiatives in different parts of the country. It's usually local or regional to, you know, really try to uh, restore the health of the forest to uh, mixed forests and uh, to, to increase deciduous species, etc. And it's going to take a generation, you know, at best, uh, you know, to do that. Uh, but there are efforts, but it's so piecemeal and requires some visionary person with, an, with pull in local government to make that sort of thing happen. And there are not enough people thinking that way because when people are looking for lumber to use they're they're looking at the price list and it's going to be 90 percent is going to be imported from somewhere just because of the low cost so um yeah people need to understand that forest the value is not simply as you know sticks of sugi that it's actually supporting the entire ecosystem uh you know watershed management all these things and it needs to be uh kept in a vital and healthy healthy uh condition yeah. It now, was Brett, the core, Brett the core you are reusing a lot of old wood. Of course, John, in your latest remodel as well, uh, all the curved, beautiful pieces. Uh, are you trying to reuse wood as much as possible because it has so much value? Yeah, I mean, I try and reuse as much as I can. Usually the, the projects that I work on are, are majority reused wood and, and to be quite honest, a, a big part of why that is is because I'm on a small island here and it's really hard to get <laughs> uh, new materials. You know, you have to bring it from the mainland and it's just a, it's, um, it's easier sometimes for me to get a hold of, of beams because there are also, unfortunately, houses being dismantled, uh, you know, at a, a greater rate than, um, you know, a greater rate at all times. But, but that means that there is uh, old materials that I can go in and, and reclaim and use in, in other projects. And one of the things that that brings up is that, you know, when you're working with these older houses, you realize uh, how much more variety the old forests mm -hmm. had because you're working with a much wider variety of materials in these old houses. You know, the, the, the main beams might be pine and you might have floorboards that are um, you know, chestnut or, I mean, there's just a variety of different uh, materials and, and you see the natural shapes that they're in and um, and that gives you sort of a sense of the handcraft, uh, handcrafted nature of these houses and the and the time and skill that went into um, crafting, crafting them and, and just the sort of respect for uh, the materials and then just how how central the forest was to people's livelihoods you know, at that time and, and how uh, important a resource the forest was. And I think that's um, something that, you know, going back to what Asby was saying, that's something that's very important. And, and I would like to see more of that sort of um, recognized these days as well, just how important the forests are, not just as a, you know, a commodity, not just for the lumber, but, but as a part of, of mm. uh, the entire ecosystem and, and a part of our lives. Mm. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things you're pointing to, Brett, though, is like, it, it, there's all these different types of wood in a building, and it's usually very local, and mm. we talk about respect and stuff like that, but I'm pretty aware of the fact that, you know, you just can't go get other stuff, you know? I mean, 100 years, 200 years ago, you go down the street and you get what you can get, and you use it, and you take care of it, um, so I think we also need to be, like, not be too uh i mean and so what that means is um we have to be intentional about this and we also have to realize that it is expensive you know you can't it it takes time to do what these people did and so you can do other things but you can do other things faster and you can kind of I, what i like to do is you know do things that are less expensive where i can and do things that you know but, you know, we, we live in a totally different world. And so I think we can't romanticize it too much. And we have to realize that, you know, we can do local, we can do all that sort of thing, but um, it's not cheap to renovate a Cominca. I just want to tell everybody that. Like, right. it's as expensive as building a new house if you want to do it right. And if you yeah. don't do it right, it's, you're killing the Cominca. So that's okay too, but just know it. That's the yeah. truth, you know? I, I guess what... <laughs> truth <laughs> yeah I, I guess i'm just reflecting on both what brett said and what you just said uh john uh and maybe this is something that i think alex has touched on time and time again uh you know over the years is uh, it's hard for me to s escape a sense of impoverishment when i look at for instance let's say the types of wood that were available uh and the, the types of skills that were available and the types of sensibility that was brought to that uh that the time we're impoverished in, in terms of time as well uh and you have to have a sort of historical perspective in order to recognize that uh and yes it's expensive we're in a different world but why and does it have to be this way or or can we somehow at least in our small corners uh help plant the seeds uh you know to, to help build or, or or restore or or somehow evolve these other sensibilities um, if, if i could add to what asby's saying for example and john a follow up on really your key point which is the expense and there's there's a mechanism as to why wood uh, it, it has to be imported from japan and uh, abroad and it's expensive because Japan, supposedly the land of quality, chose the most low quality sugi to grow in a very low quality way. Mm -hmm. And they could have been, for example, planting with keaki. Mm -hmm. If you cut down one 70 year old keaki tree, it would probably be worth 300 sugis. And you could even export that beautiful wood to the world. But they didn't plant the keaki, they wiped it out. And so now if you want keaki, it costs a fortune. So there's a reason, an institutionalized reason, why these things are now rare and expensive. And the reality, as you say, that, that is the reality. Mm. Uh, however, with more sustainable forestry and more uh, intelligent, even business-minded forest, I, weirdly, the sugi which was done mm. in the name of making money is a financial disaster <laughs> and they didn't plant the wood that would make money so all of this is is correctable if there's some vision brought to it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think that's that's part of the point that i that i wanted to make with those different materials as well is that there was an intentionality to it and 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 they were using the materials that were local to them because that's the easiest and that was you know what was around them but there was an intentionality to why those materials were also available locally. You know, they're the, the, the ancestors of those, those people planted the seeds, as you were talking about, planted those trees with the intention that in the future, they could be harvested to use for building new houses. And um, I think that's just sort of a mindset that uh, would be nice to, to have a little more of. I mean, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna create enough trees to fulfill the whole you know demand for everything but but uh, in certain areas and in certain cases uh, yeah and what asby was saying earlier too which is that the trees weren't, weren't just for houses or maybe it was alex uh <laughs> that there there was all these other things that they were for and that's why they they you know from food to you know all sorts of you know material goods that they were for and that's part of the problem that we have to face is that we don't need those anymore i mean we could want them but uh, they don't necessarily need them anymore, right? Um, like one thing that comes to mind, for instance, mm -hmm. is just wood for your bath. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of great wood that's in architecture because 
it was also the same kind of wood that was great for heating the bath, mm. you know, <laughs> among mm. other things. Especially um, pine. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Or, you know, what I think of is a lot of the other hardwoods um, that you find yeah, all what around. I, I mean, what I use for making charcoal, oh. obviously, is <laughs> the same kind of thing. Usually yeah. oak, yeah. isn't it, for charcoal? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a few different varieties, but yeah, oak is the main, the yeah. main one. Mm-hmm. Or camellia down here in the in the islands. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, camellia you guys are so passionate about wood and trees because you've <laughs> all worked with it and been carpenters or connected to carpenters or written about carpenters. Um, but I am so excited to have you four in the same room here. I would love to know what Brett and John have in terms of questions for their mentors, <laughs> Asby and Alex. <laughs> Anything, you guys? Put you on the spot here? I think Asby and I have the questions. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Go for it. You first, Alex. Alex, <laughs> Alex you got questions? Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, one thing I'd like to ask both of you, because this is an issue that comes up a lot and that I think about, which is... Uh, when we're restoring these kominka, I mean, I'm, I'm a great believer. I always say I'm pulling them into the modern age. So I'm not in the restoration business. I'm not trying to show people that this is how it was in the Meiji era or something. I want to modernize them because otherwise modern people can't live in them or use them. That said, to what degree do we want to really stick with traditional, everything traditional, right? Traditional um, uh, plastering. Uh, using you know bamboo and and all the all the, the the full traditional approach, or to what degree do we use modern materials? And I've found my own mix, but but I'd be really curious to know what you guys and how you guys think of it and what you're doing with regard to that. Um, I I think everybody's going to have their own their own mix and their own philosophy. I I personally tend to be on the the sort of very using the traditional te- techniques and materials and. That's my own sort of personal philosophy, and I feel like there's a there's a niche in there, and there's people that enjoy that, but but it's not going to be the way that everybody wants to do it, and 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 that's totally fine. Um, my my personal sort of feeling is that I would like to sort of um, keep that possibility alive for the folks who do want to to do things um, that way, and 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 other folks can you know can can do it a, a different way, and that's that's totally totally fine. I think there's room for all different ways of, of uh, tackling these problems. And it's also really the only way that those skills will survive is if mm-hmm. we go on doing it. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So I have a different take on this, which is I don't think it's about the tradition. Um, for me, it's about using materials that can go back to the earth easily. You know, so if you cut it, you open up and it's the same material. So the tradition oftentimes if not more than often more often than not rather um kind of wins the day you know you try a bunch of things and you're like damn it i can't beat two thousand years of tradition you know but that said um you know if you've got wood stone glass earth all these wonderful materials you can do things that you never that nobody ever imagined like i can make a window that you can shoot a gun at and it doesn't leak, you know, that, you know, um, if you, if you want to do it, you just have to be interested in that next step. And then you have to have that client that, you know, wants to do it with you or whatever. Um, and so that's my focus is like, I don't, you know, and I'm not against these other materials completely either. Um, there's a time and a place for them, but to the extent that I can, if I don't need to do it, then I'd rather go the other route, but then really go into the, the science, like the investigation of how that can be done intelligently um, with, uh, quite frankly, all the different uh, tools that we have in our modern day. You know, uh, that's that's the leg up that we have now in 2024 is that we have this incredible set of tools that they didn't have. Um, so that's kind of my take on, on that. Yeah. Uh, 
That's interesting. Um, and that kind of connects me to what I would like to ask you guys, um, because, you know, it, it, your work is depending on clients and so much of what, uh, let's say, builders or architects uh, need to do is to help clients understand, to educate their clients uh, to some degree while responding to what they want or what they desire. Uh, and often that leads to conflicts. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there are any particular stories you might have to share without naming names of a situation where you thought something should really be done a certain way and the client just wouldn't go for it and uh, you know you sort of locked horns uh, on this issue and and what was it about <laughs> i don't know maybe john has more <laughs> more of those kind of um, stories than i do <laughs> can i jump in while they're thinking yeah sure. of course my clients have largely been the government yeah and boy, do we have those issues all the time. Mm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, for example, they will not use any kind of COSI, old material, as a support, oh, as, a, mm. as a standing column that will support anything. It's all got to be decorative. Mm. And that seems mm. to be some kind of a rule. I don't know where it, how it came in. Mm. Those kind of issues. Or um, uh, yeah. oh, it, it, even silly things like with our houses where we would want to put electronic key, you know, keys where you button, you type in the number, you know, and that mm. was a handbook. They wouldn't allow it. Mm. And we had to go all the way to the prefecture to get approval, you know, for things like that. Mm. So when it comes to bureaucracy, there is an awful lot of it. Yeah. I think it might be a little easier with private. Lately, I've been doing more work with private clients. Mm. That shifted mm. a lot, actually. Mm. Mm. And there, boy, it's much easier. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think what, they, what they, Alex they, is saying they, rings true for me. Yeah, yeah they, know, uh, they know what they're getting because they've seen your work and they come to you for that. But still, I've seen situations uh, right. where maybe the, the, the carpenter is more of a purist or more stubborn. Uh, and, uh, and, and sometimes the, the client, you know. Yeah, that's a good point, Hasby. I mean, we, for example, Soma Kosha is really stubborn. Um, mm. And... Uh, to, to Alex's point, when we work on cultural heritage sites or something, you know, it's exactly what he just said all the time. And we really can't do anything about it. But the good news is, A, you find out what you don't want to do. And B, as long as you can be polite and vocal, and when you, if you're working hard and you have integrity, it actually does do something you know when you work with these people there's this huge group of people that they're just are ar they're architects and they're not working with their hands on it but it affects them um when if you're polite you work with integrity and then you voice your opinion uh in a senile way like a, a i don't know how you say it in english meek way um uh so i think you are affecting change to some extent i, mean, I don't know when it's going to happen but then on the other end of it is we just from the get-go um, are usually really clear with the client. Like we're really, you know, stubborn about what we do. And so if you don't want to do that, let's not even like move forward. Um, and then sometimes we get a client, like I was saying, who wants to do something kind of new and interesting. And uh, that can be really cool when you feel like they have the, uh, capacity to do that, which means time, energy, passion, you know, all that money, all that stuff. And if they don't seem to have all that, that covered, but they still want to do something kind of inventive, um, then you kind of have to say, sorry, I don't think we can do that on this project because you don't want to disappoint them, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a lot of different opportunities. It's very, very, it's super varied, but um, both of those things have happened, to say the least. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to yeah, mix say. it up a little bit because it looks like Robert Yellen is in the waiting room. Robert, do you want to jump in here and say hi? Uh, no, no. I <laughs> no, okay, okay. <laughs> we didn't scare you, dude. All right, well, your your ears must have been burning. Back out. Yeah, we mentioned Clay, so that must have brought him in. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I Brett. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I want to ask Asby and Alex some questions. I mean, they kind of yeah, flipped the tables on it, us. But um, I guess what I want to ask you is uh, I want you to 
give me some insight on what makes you the most optimistic about this because I like hearing that. <laughs> I can like answer that one real fast. Yeah. You guys, the existence of you guys, and you guys weren't around 20, 30 years ago. Honestly, mm -hmm. that's what does it. I see these people doing incredible things, and it didn't exist. Mm. And so, that, so that's what makes me optimistic. And it's not only the Thatchers, but Brett making charcoal and you doing what you're doing with carpentry and plastering and all the rest of it. That's just astonishing. Mm. So that, that's what makes me optimistic. Yeah, I'll just echo that. Um, going, thinking back to the time when, for instance, uh, Takisha san you know, when I first became aware of Takisha san our great colleague and mentor, I suppose, to, to, to us as well. Um, you know, when he did a house, it was in the newspaper. You know, it was like, wow, it was news. You know, and uh, and now there are so many people. And again, young, I, you guys don't maybe don't think you're young, but <laughs> you are. I'm and, pretty young. Uh, <laughs> younger people, <laughs> yeah, uh, doing this. And 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 like I was saying earlier, uh, it's possible to find great craftsmen in almost every region of Japan uh, for carpentry, for thatching, for roofing, for clay, for for almost everything else. So, um, and this is this is a tremendous growth. It's still only a small, tiny fraction of what we hope it could be or what it may really take for it to become fully viable to continue for another generation or, or several. But compared to 30 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot better to, yeah. from every, every aspect that I can see. And again, it's this race against time, though. And, and will mm -hmm. this grow to a great enough critical mass, which it looks like it has, uh, you know, as when we go to the Miko Summit, uh, will it grow enough to to really have the momentum just to continue as a cultural norm rather than an exception? And to me, that will be uh, a, an important uh, tipping point if that happens. And, and I would I say, add, uh, sorry, but I'm just going to cut it. You go. You speak first. Sorry, just just a quick thing. Yeah, I would just say that there these days maybe part of it is that there are so many great opportunities for sharing that information that maybe didn't exist in the past. In the past, whether it be social media or you know YouTube or whatever, there's so many opportunities for people to connect and join together and share their knowledge that um, that sort of makes things grow at a, at a more exponential right. rate. Mm. You actually said what I was going to say. It's people like Joy, like Joy that are also part of this story Joy. and this ecosystem. The influencers and the, the YouTubers and the people that write articles about it and Joy, like Joy, you really follow up on it. That's part of it, and that's new. Wow. That really did this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an example of, you know, the internet as a positive force. <laughs> I don't know if people could hear it. Basically, it's this internet interesting ecosystem. Yeah. We need to tap in to the same community of Japanese people because one of the biggest things for me is that I have a community of hundreds and hundreds of Japanese carpenters and plasterers and all of that who teach me who encourage me, who support me every step of the way. And uh, I don't know how we do that more uh, as foreign people other than maybe learning Japanese, but um, that is huge. If you can be a part of that community, it's massive. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that goes back a little bit to what Robert was, was Robert Yellen and uh, the previous guest was saying how he had a, a potter that was looking for apprentices. And in my experience, if there was sort of a, a way to create those connections, there probably are, you know, the whole world of people who would jump at that opportunity to be an apprentice to a potter in, you know, in, in mountainside Japan or something. It's just sort of making those, those uh, connections. And, and, and for somebody who's in their 70s or 80s and, and his main focus is pottery, maybe they don't know how to make those kind of connections but but their the opportunities are there and the people who want to take advantage of those opportunities are are also there yeah, yeah. um i i would love to hear alex and asby give you guys advice for when you guys should start writing books <laughs> <laughs> Because Alex and Asby, you started like in the practical sense, like John and Brett are doing, and you started writing books at some point. Is it a time for them to start writing books? What do you think? 
I think there's any time to write yeah, books. Um, and although you may feel it's going to take away from your time for your work, and in my case, you know, I didn't expect to write a book, but ended up writing what became a book and, uh, and, and wrote more and more. Of course, Alex seems to like have a new book every year, so he, no, but it's, it's, it's better, <laughs> better just, advice I, from him. But well, I but say I go ahead and write down the material and keep yeah. keep your notes and and document the stuff and then write down or record what you're thinking and feeling about the work because that is the the, the most important part i mean the the technical side is is easy to communicate in a way but but really you know why is it important what's important and why and and in your in your own words in your own language i think if you can capture that you should maybe you know talking to your you know recorder every now and then if if writing is is going to be laborious and i just want to say in, in my case I started writing way back. I was in the 1980s and we didn't have internet or email or anything. And I would write like 10 page letters to my mom, you know, and uh, saying, this is what I saw today. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that became the voice that I write with, uh, as if I'm explaining to my mother, uh, you know, who is intelligent, but just didn't know much about the subject. So uh, well, always sense. think of the person there's, there should be an imaginary person that you're addressing about this uh, is my advice. So. Yeah. But, you, you know, Asby and I are relics of a bygone era <laughs> because we write. And I'm not sure that writing books is the only way to do it. And I would imagine that YouTubing or, for example, doing a series of YouTube programs about your different, of even doing the, Brit, if you did one on charcoal, I would be your most loyal watcher. It's fascinating, <laughs> really. And the people that watch those things, and it matters. And... Uh, we know from Jaya, you know, the impact that that can have about houses. And I would say that writing might not be the only way. And I actually wish that I had more time to do YouTube programs <laughs> uh, because somehow, sometimes the impact of that can be even stronger. Yeah. Do you, could I just ask a, a quick question on, on what, what, how do you narrow down the topic that you like? How do you, how do you choose something that, that, you know, out of all of the things that you could, could, write about or to make a video about how do you how do you sort of find the one that is like oh yeah that's that's what i'm going to focus on and and do as my main topic you first alex <laughs> it well for me it's always come naturally it's whatever i was passionate about it it's passion you're passionate about charcoal you do charcoal later on you get passionate about floorboards you do floorboards so it's not like you know only do one thing and right. uh, and one's own interests shift and grow you know, um, but in it, uh, I was passionate about Ia Valley and Chiori, and so I started with that. Mm -hmm. Then I got passionate about the destruction of the environment, and I did something very different, very journalistic, and switched to mm -hmm. dogs and demons. And then recently I've come back more to let's find what is beautiful and remains within Japan that we can still see and value, you know. And these are all what, what I care about at the moment. So that would be my feeling, Aspie. Yeah, it's definitely... It, it's always emerged out of my own fascination with something and my own wanting to know more about it. But then at some point, like this decision to, to like make a book out of it, uh, it becomes because there seems to be a problem that I think is worth addressing. There, there's something that needs attention called to it, whether it's environmental things or, or, or something about, you know, co uh, resource use in houses or, or whatever. So uh, maybe I, I get, can tend to be a bit of a scold from time to time, you know, okay. saying, oh, you people, you know, you have to pay attention to this. But I definitely have that aspect. But it, it begins with my own love of whatever it is I'm looking at and experiencing and doing. Uh, if I didn't love it, I wouldn't be able to do it. Looks like we might have lost Brett. <laughs> he might come back. Sorry. That, that uh, last thing that you guys, you know, about passion that you guys just both said, this is what I keep telling all of the apprentices. It's like, if you, uh, it should just kind of be a fountain spring that comes out of you. And if, you, if it's it not, then you probably need to go somewhere else. <laughs> because uh, nobody can, uh, Nobody can make you want it, you know? right. um, and you're not going to be happy if you're not just like following that. Um, yeah. And so that advice about writing really sound really rings, you know, close to my heart about that. You know, right now I just want to keep doing this, so I'm just doing it. 
but um, and I also want to say again, as an elder, <laughs> you know, all of us get to a point, uh, maybe several times, where we say, "Wow, is this really worth it?" You know, you know, uh, can I continue this? Is it really worth it? Uh, and and maybe we make changes in our lives, or, or or maybe some people quit, or some people just find a way, uh, say, "Yes, it's worth it." But uh, don't be afraid of that. I don't feel like that's a sign of failure or or a lack of your own talent or or um, willpower. Uh, we all get there, and because partly it's because we're dealing with stuff that. Uh, really requires social support, support from society in general. And I think, Alex, I'm sure you went through that, um, where you say, my God, I've been talking about this for a long time, doing everything I can, and nothing's changing. <laughs> and uh, you just say, what, you know, what am I doing? <laughs> right? You, yeah, you feel like a voice in the wind, you know. Mm. But then uh, small things happen, and you say, oh, my God, someone did pick up on that. Yeah. Or... And sometimes it's not even someone you ever met or knew. Mm. It can be in a rather distant place and a different, and you go, gosh, yeah, it, it, it was worth doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the macro, for example, after all these decades of me talking about uh, public works and forestry and da, 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 and I feel, well, it's had zero impact, but then you go to somewhere and they're actually doing something experimental. Right. They're thinking and people are out there thinking, there are people writing books about it and you go, hmm, you know, there's a community there. There are some people who want to know this. Uh, it's, it's worth slogging on, you know. Yeah. Plus, and they're, they're looking for people to learn from. Yeah. Plus now we're addicted to writing and we can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think, you know, like Robert Yellen does with updating his Instagram all the time, right? Like mm -hmm. even old dogs can learn new tricks kind of thing. I don't, I don't mean to call anybody old, but that's <laughs> the expression, right? <laughs> um, Brett, you've been trying to do YouTube. I know John has as well, right? Um, but it's also yeah. you need the following. You need people watching and uh, right. people engaged. But doing it regularly, that's, that's great advice. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, I've... I've started and stopped a few times and and i did actually do one on charcoal making last year that was that was like probably the one time that i actually sat down and edited clips together and all of a sudden that's the one that just you know like took off and and oh, I've got to look for that yeah there, there definitely is uh i think an audience there that would be interested in and it's just for me i think it's it's while doing the work to to have the presence of mind to set the camera and you know take the footage and and make sure that it actually is look is going to look decent so that people are going to want to watch it or you know that it has value to them so. yeah now one last question i'd love to ask which i asked as we at the minka summit uh for the minka masters panel is how can we inspire the future generations to be interested and care about uh, traditional houses, traditional design. I would love to hear from you, John. You've got a young son. I love to see you introducing carpentry to him. You think he's got the bug. Uh, how can we inspire kids to be interested? No Just get idea. them working with us? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> play. Make it play, right? Something like that, right? I don't even know why I'm interested, to be honest. Oh. Um, I don't know what the but I don't know what it is. Um, I mean, I played video games my whole young adult life, and you know, I didn't do anything like this. Um, I have no clue, Joy. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I mean, the pe some people will get inspired. I don't know what it is. It's probably something in the air that we don't see that we don't understand. But I think keep getting it out there, right? What you're doing, think, just talking about it, will inspire other people. Joy, right? what, going, Joy what, you're saying, what you're saying is key, Joy. And John, is you're both kind of touching on the same thing, which is you, can't, you don't inspire people because you don't even know who they're going to be. And people come because of their karma and something within themselves. But you can make yourself available. You can put the information out there that is fun and beautiful and exciting and amazing and cool and forward looking and all those things, futuristic and all those things that we can show that, that this is. And as to who's going to take up on it, I wouldn't have a clue. You don't know. You can't calculate it. But someone will. 
mm. and they're just out there. And so it, it's it's about being available. I think that's I, I totally agree. I think like I was just saying, just put your put your passion out there. If you have a passion for this or, or for whatever whatever it is, if you put that passion out there and are willing to share it, then there are going to be people who um, pick up on that. Yeah, I think, Joy, maybe my reply when you asked me at the summit, and you may remember, I don't remember, had something to do with uh, the importance of people actually experiencing it themselves, uh, you know, physically in reality. So the more that we can, like, make opportunities or, or build situations where people can go and if, if it's not an actual building uh, workshop or sort of thing, or it's just going to be inside a beautiful old house. And uh, one example was that uh, I, I'm teaching at uh, uh, Japan Women's University in the architecture department. I brought my grad students to come occur to visit takeshi sans houses. And of there was like 16 students. It was their first time to be in a real Japanese minka. They were, they were at the end of their architectural education and none of them had actually ever really experienced one, which was shocking to me, but I could just see something melting inside them and being replaced by this pure experiential joy and awe. And, and the result of that, you know, maybe it will take years to pay off. But um, I think this is something particular where people actually have to experience it. And that's something that all of us can do is to, to help make it possible for more people to experience these beautiful things. That's so true. And yeah, take away the point. idea that it's dark and dirty and cold, right? Even like, if it is. Beautiful. <laughs> but it's charming and it's beautiful. And it's well, if there's anything, if there's anything that inspired me, it was definitely like just happening to be in some of those spaces and then mm. even when i was younger in america going to like an old barn in new hampshire mm. uh, or covered bridge you know before i even knew about japan if there was anything that inspired carpentry perhaps when you say that then it clicks to me yeah i mean that felt amazing i didn't i didn't know what was going on but it felt amazing so that so don't let them all disappear i guess is the answer mm. Well, that is our time. We have to end it there. We could talk all night. You guys have so much amazing knowledge to share. Thank you so much for all of you joining. It's been an amazing end to a 500th episode. I hope to have many more with all of congratulations, you. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Thank congratulations you. and thanks for having Thank us. Thank you for yeah. having us. I'm sure we'll all be so talking much. more. Yeah. Thanks for arranging this wonderful talk. This mm. is wonderful. And I love the, the ending on getting it out there right because that's what we can all do that's all we can do is just try to keep getting the message out there thanks everyone for joining see you next time thank you and applause to you joy thank you